Hello there, my name is Brandon and welcome to the third and final part of our three-part series focused on making isometric pixel art in Clip Studio Paint. In the previous video we finalized the room design and in this video we're going to bring it to life with some animation using the timeline function, so let's get to it. Before setting up an animation, one of the most important things to consider is layer organization. What I've done here is I've separated out all the objects that I plan to animate onto their own layers. That way I have that sort of individual control of them without affecting the rest of the illustration. A lot of the other folders we can see here are just from the way that I was organizing things while I was creating this illustration, but I can tidy this up even further since most of this static background design can probably just be grouped together. If you want to create new folders like this to tuck your layers away, you can select all the ones that you wish to put into a folder, and then go to Layer, Create Folder, and Insert Layer, and then give it a name if you want. Now it's a lot clearer when looking at my layers that I've got the static room separated from all the individual layers that I plan to animate. So let's consider a really simple animation for the robot here. Let's say that I want to have him bobbing up and down by just one pixel. Well, one of the things I can do is to actually get those positions ready before even opening up the animation tool. To keep things clear, let's rename the robot layer to robot down. Then we'll duplicate this layer and call the new one robot up. And now I'm going to activate the move tool and bump this layer up by one pixel. Sorry, that's probably really hard to see the difference between those two layers, uh, but maybe if I just drag them out here, hopefully you can tell that robot up is actually one pixel higher than robot down. So the idea is that these two frames are just going to trade off to give us that bobbing up and down animation. Now to actually configure these into an animation, we'll click on Window, then Timeline to bring up the animation timeline. You'll see it's completely empty right now, so we need to create a new timeline by clicking on the button labeled New Timeline. It'll give us a few options to change, and we're just going to run with these preset values, uh, but the most important things to note here are the frame rate, which is the frames per second or speed of the animation, from my personal experience, somewhere between 8 frames and 12 frames per second works particularly well for pixel art animation. So we'll go with 10 in this case. And then the other value that's important is the playback time, which is the total frame count of the animation. Currently this is set to 24 frames, which means we'll have 24 unique frames to work with, after which it'll loop back to the start and play those 24 again. You can of course increase or decrease this as you require, but I really love working with 24 frame loops because it's divisible into many different values. So if you want to create small subrhythms in an animation, a 24 count is really versatile. All right, once we click OK, we'll see the timeline we just created, showing us that frame count from 1 to 24 along the top, and then all of our layers along the side. Within this timeline, the best way to organize the individual components we'll be animating, like the robot, is to place them into what are called animation folders. So to get started on the robot, we'll click on this icon here to create a new animation folder, and you can see over in my layers panel that this new animation folder has been added to the list. Except right now it's totally empty, so what I'm going to do is rename it to robot, and then I'm going to drag our up and down positions from earlier into that folder. Now that they're in the folder, we're able to go to that row of the timeline and specify which of those layers we want to appear on any given frame. Right now it's actually not displaying either of them, so the way that we'll tell it what to show is by clicking on the specify cells button. When we click, it's going to ask us which of our frames from this animation folder we wish to display. So I'm going to start with the down position and then click OK. Now what's happened is that it's decided to auto populate that frame across the entire 24 available frames. So if I were to hit play, uh, nothing's really moving yet because it's just showing us that down position across the entire timeline. To create the bobbing, what I want to try is alternating each position every four frames. So I'm going to start by shrinking that active area of the robot animation just to a total of eight frames. Then I'll measure out the first four frames for the down position, which means that I want the up position to start on frame 5, and then play until frame 8. When I click on frame 5, you can see that it's targeted because of that red highlight. And then I'll go back to the Specify Cells menu, and this time I'm going to select Robot Up. Now you can see that our little 8 frame window here is divided into two halves, with the first four frames belonging to the down position, and the last four to the up position. When we play this, we're going to see one quick bob, and then the robot disappears, and that's because we haven't populated out the rest of the 24 frame count. To multiply this out, we'll right click on the box itself and select copy, and then on the next available empty frame, we'll paste this loop. And if we do that one more time, we'll have populated that entire 24 frame count with three subloops of eight. See that's where that favorable division comes in handy, right? 
So now when we play the animation back, we've got a full 24 frames of our robot bobbing up and down. Now that example worked out quite well because we knew exactly what frames we were going to animate before we even started. But let me show you how to add new animation frames on the fly. Like let's say we want to animate this monitor here with some scrolling text, but we're not quite sure yet how many frames that's even going to take. Well, we can start by creating that animation folder for the monitor and dropping that one frame that we do have into it. Next, let's specify that one cell, um, and that's easy enough because it's our only option currently. Well, we know that there needs to be at least a second frame for this to be considered an animation. So I'm going to click on frame two of the timeline, and then this time we're going to click on the icon labeled new animation cell. Now you can see that we've got that split in the thumbnail again, showing how the original frame plays on frame one, and then our new animation cell starts on frame two. And right now the monitor is blank on frame two because our new animation cell artwork layer doesn't even have any art on it yet. So it's up to us to draw the next frame of the design. In this case, it'd be really handy to be able to reference what was on frame one while I'm designing because I wanna make sure that the new text position is in a different spot. So I'm gonna click on the enable onion skin button. And this is an animation term, which means that it'll show a transparent version of the layers before and after the current one to assist you in that referencing. So that dark blue text on the monitor is actually the original frame appearing in sort of a low opacity overlay color to guide us, but it's not actually present in the artwork itself. With the dot pen, I'm going to draw some new text in a different position than the first frame. That way, when they play together, it'll look like it has some motion to it. Now, I think what this needs to really sell it is a third frame with yet another position of text. So again, I create a new animation cell and then repeat the steps to make a third frame. Now we've got three unique frames and we want to repeat this up to our total frame count of 24. So just like before, we'll isolate our animation loop just to those unique frames and then copy paste that loop to populate the entire timeline. When I play this back, now you can see that pulsing effect of having drawn those three unique frames for this design. What's nice about this workflow is that you can also continue to edit the layers once they've been assigned like this. So if there's anything else that I want to loop at that same three frame frequency, I can simply draw it on these existing layers and it'll follow along. So I've gone back through to add a three frame siren animation along with the monitor text frames. And now all of those things happen together with the layers that were already assigned for the monitor. So using this workflow, I'm continuing to animate the individual components of my scene. For the cat here, I'm doing more of an ambitious animation by working out a sequence of frames for it to jump over to the coffee table from the bed and then make it back in time to cycle every 24 frames. Normally when you're doing some kind of involved character animation like this, it's best to start by working out what the keyframes or key poses are gonna be. Um, kind of like the major beats of the animation. And then you'd go back through and fill in all the in-between frames to connect those key poses together. In this case, I'm actually just animating this one frame by frame and kind of improvising it as I go. Um, which is not necessarily a great technique, but to be honest, I wasn't sure exactly what kind of motion I'd be able to get in this time frame anyway. So I kind of decided to make it up one frame at a time until I reached that total of 24 frames. In order to keep track of what my next pose was gonna be and the one that it was coming from, my approach was to use a combination of the onion skin overlay together with copying over the artwork of the previous frame and then making edits to that one. Once again, this isn't necessarily the go-to procedure I'd recommend for an extended character sequence like this, but in the end, I did get something that I'm happy with, so I just wanted to share how it was done in this particular case. Another tip with pixel art animation is that we don't necessarily need to make large motions to generate the feel of movement. A lot of times we can actually play with the individual colors of the pixels themselves in combination with movement to create effective animations. In this case, I'm doing that by using the skin tone, the highlight, and the outline colors to create some movement on the character's hand. And this one's kind of my last piece of info as far as the animation workflow. So let's go ahead and take a look at how everything came together. And then I'll come back to talk about resizing and exporting the final design. All right, so the last thing I wanted to mention is about exporting your file. Uh, more specifically, if you plan on sharing your artwork online, you'll first wanna scale it up to a higher resolution. 
To change your resolution, you can go to Edit, then click Change Image Resolution. With pixel art, it's important that we scale our image at an exact integer multiple of the original canvas. Otherwise, the pixels won't be sized up equally. The easiest way to do this is to change the scale to some higher integer number. And you can see it's scaling up our original 180 pixel canvas according to that factor that I type in. I'm going to go ahead and scale this one up by 5 times to a total image size of 900 by 900 pixels. And what's incredibly important here is that you also have the interpolation method set to the hard edges setting. This is going to be what maintains those crispy square edges upon resizing, uh, rather than ending up with a blurry image. With that, we'll hit OK. And now the image has gotten a lot larger. And actually, if we measure out a single pixel of the drawing here, we'll find that it's now actually a unit of 5x5 five five pixels based on that 5 times rescaling. To export the file, we'll click on File, then Export Animation. It's also an option to enter the export sizing here. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and enter the 900 by 900 value, since we know we already resized it anyway. And we can also see that it'll be exporting the entire 24 frame sequence at a rate of 10 FPS. And with that, we'll get our final resized file. All right, well, that'll do it for the series. I hope you had fun following the creation of this artwork. And as a special treat, we'll finish out with some close-up shots on a CRT television for that added retro touch. Uh, it's a segment that I like to call CRT time over on my channel. And we'll leave a link down below if you'd like to check out more of my work. So best of luck with your artwork, and thanks for watching.